This is landscape in succession, the cultural impact from glacier to managed plan. Toronto's descriptive name is trees reflected in the water or a place of plenty and owes its geomorphology to water in its various forms. The first was the water's crushing weight as a glacier higher than the CN Tower, deeply compressing the earth, which continues to rebound and the glaciers retreat northwesterly, scouring a path of ravines and valleys, leaving sand and aggregate deposits atop the shale and limestone of the compressed bedrock. The permeable sand relic of the glaciation promotes drainage and water flow in the form of springs, perfect environment for the vegetation of a black oak savanna. Savanna features ephemeral streams, ponds and plant life related to climate, rain and snowfall in turn support animal life, much of which is migratory. Into this rich environment came the first people, hunter-gatherers following and camping along trails which traversed the high grounds close to good food sources. With the development of the canoe, water transport allowed fast, quiet mobility. The Humber drops 393 meters between its sources and Bloor Street, one of the steepest drops of any river in North America, making it unnavigable. Low, we have the Toronto carrying place. Following the high ground, in use at least 4,000 years with campsites that old and of a similar age, the Humber Marshes, which you see here, generally in their present form, teeming with salmon, sturgeon, pickerel, trout, turtles, and birds. The Iroquois and human population, Peyton, Neutral, Huron-Windat, and the later farmer traders, Senecas of the Five Nations Confederacy, made their footprint with fishing the marshes, with hunting, and in the last millennium, with slash and burn agriculture. For the trade route between the Gulf of Mexico and the North Shore copper mine, this was its major link, funneling through the portage here or to the east. The First Nation population by 1700 was Anishinaabe, Mississaugas who came south, naming the Humber's portage Kobichinonk, leave the canoes and go back. It was from them that the British made the 1787 and 185 Toronto purchase of the local land, but much more importantly, of the carrying place. The roadway from Humber Bay to Penetanguishin, inland and safe from American marauders. Parks Canada and the Canadian Heritage Rivers Board recognized the Humber's importance in the historical development of Canada as a nation. The Aboriginal portage route used by the French and the British justifying the designation of the Humber as Canada's 26th Heritage River System in 1998 with the dedication ceremonies in September 1999. It required the approval and signatures of both federal and provincial ministers. Sheila Copps had signed off for the Government of Canada. A reenactment of the first day of Lieutenant Governor Simcoe's 1793 journey up the Toronto Carrying Place was staged in order to get the Ontario sign-off delivered by member of the legislature, Derwin Shea, former chair of the Toronto Planning Board. It became an annual event reflecting the local cultural heritage. Perceived as invaluable by the French entrepreneurs and explorers of the 17th century and by those who remained after the fall of Quebec, the site at the foot of Riverside overlooking the marshes was the location of Fort Pontneuf, the second Toronto trading fort and later the homestead site of Jean-Baptiste Rousseau and family. Here we have Riverside Drive in 1913, 
120 years after Elizabeth Simcoe's description of her ride up the same trail on September 4, 1793. Mrs. Simcoe wrote on, wrote on Wednesday, September the 4th, 1793, I rode to St. John's Creek. There is a ridge of land extending near a mile beyond St. John's house, 300 feet high and not more than three feet wide. Smooth turf. There is a great deal of hemlock spruce on this river. The banks are dry and pleasant. I gathered a species of polygala, which is a genus of annual and perennial herbs and shrubs of the order Polygalaceae. By then, this was uh, 1910, entrepreneur and visionary Robert Holmes Smith had acquired the lands along the Valley of the Humber with the purpose of a planned and comprehensive residential development. He had a love and understanding of the river, its history, and then cultural landscape. His aunt, Kathleen Lazars, had just published The Valley of the Humber, still recognized as an authentic historical guide, if no longer the major historical overview of the area. Riverside was the first of his developments and followed accurately the Toronto carrying place along the Drumlin to Bloor. It was a footprint development, planned roads with meanders and house sites with specified individual setbacks so that each had a front and side exposure. You bought his concept or he did not sell to you. It was a homesmith build or your design had to be approved by him or his company and the trees and ravines were not to be disturbed. 50 years was the maximum that he could place on title, but enough to instill the community's atmosphere, a cultural landscape protection and to avoid a uniform bylaw streetscape. Toronto roads are about to restructure Riverside Drive with a cement sidewalk and a new retaining wall above the marshes with some tree loss. While they will not destroy Holmesmith's islands in the road, its tiny meanders, swales and edge meanderings or rural quality is to be wiped out. The road is being standardized to facilitate traffic flow. In May of 1997, Metropolitan Toronto proclaimed a series of 150 ancient oak trees along the carrying place between the foot of Riverside and Dundas Street to be a grove named with the permission of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, the Tubananique Grove. Tubananique was the daughter of Wabanose, the chief of the Mississaugas at the time of the Toronto Purchase and mother of Peter Jones, the chief who moved them to New Credit. This is a further overview of, uh, area view of Riverside Drive, which shows again some of the, the setbacks and meanders. Um, in 2015, at Lucy Maud Montgomery's Parquet, she lived down the street, on the 400th anniversary of Etienne Brulé's arrival as the first European to visit the north shore of Lake Ontario, a set of flagstones with moccasins imprinted were laid through the ancient oaks beside the roadway, acknowledging the historical presence of First Nations. Mississauga elder Gary Sue offered a prayer and greeting. Robert Holmes Smith laid out his development proposal and plan of subdivision as a net naturally and culturally based complete community. Here we see Humberview Road in the distance. Part of the building which you see on the road, rem on the road remains, incorporated in 55 Humberview. The old mill trestle bridge crosses the river. The small building at the edge of the plateau was Purity Springs Bottling Works. The plateau itself was the old orchard of the Babis, and on it, 
to the left of the picture and behind the photographer was the Bobby House, nestled against the south ravine of Bobby Point, well protected from weather and flood. Jacques Dupelin de Babi, Inspector General of Upper Canada, following his time as a prisoner of war in the War of 1812, acquired the land between Jane Street and the Humber River in 1815. On October the 21st, 2011, Gary Elders, uh, Elder Gary Sue sang a prayer on the floodplain by the Old Mill Bridge at the plaque unveiling for the Mississauga, Huron-Wendat and Seneca circles on the shared path, Santia Partagé. The salmon were leaping in the background. These plaques along the Humber portray the cultural landscape in Toronto's first historical park. Holmesmith's Bobby Point development occupies what was a sunken island in Ice Age Lake Iroquois. The entire area is registered as, an, as of archaeological significance. It contains the Seneca village of Tayagon from the mid-1600s, means where it crosses the river. The high ground of Bobby Point is bracketed on the south by the graduated ravine slope and plateau at Humberview leading to the Old Mill Bridge and on the north by the ravine slope of Old Dundas Street from 1793 leading from the Davenport Ridge down to the site of the former 1811 bridge crossing, washed out by Hurricane Hazel in 1954. A steep and defensible vantage, the view from Bobby Point Peninsula is of the only two places where it is possible to cross the river. This plaque at the junction of Bobby Point Road and Bobby Point Crescent was unveiled by Percy Robinson in 1948 and erected by the York Pioneers Historical Society, York Township Council and York Township Board of Education. The remainder of the site is comprised of the tennis courts and community clubhouse, which was part of Holmesmith's development. It was from here that René Robert Cavalier de La Salle departed on one of the three most important voyages of exploration in North American history. He was following the um, paths of, that he, he learned about from the uh, Aboriginal people. Uh, his, he wrote, Pour reprendre la suite de mon voyage, je parti l'an passé, pa, passé de Taillegon le 22 août et arrivé le 23e au bord du lac Toronto où j'ai resté deux, mes deux, deux de mes déserteurs, Gabriel Minim et l'autre grand, grand maison. So on the 22nd of August this year, 1680, I left. Bobby Point went up Humbercrest Boulevard past Madeline's house to Lake Simcoe, where I busted these two guys, uh, Meme and Grand Maison, who'd run off with some of my trade goods. <laughs> and that was the first sentence of his account of that voyage where he discovered the Mississippi uh, and, and went all the way down to the bottom of it and then returned. And, and he, he sent that report back to Louis de France. In 1995, a group of reenactors from Kente Portage fired off a musket salute at the same location, honoring Fort Duville, the site, of, uh, the site Paul, Dr. Paul Germain identified as its mostly locale. Uh, it was, this was one of the three Magasin Royale of 1720. Uh, the other two were Fort Niagara and, and the Fort at Kente where Germain was from. To the south, Bobby Point Crescent curves away in 1912, providing for Robert Holmes Smith's future carefully sighted homes now existing as he dreamt. Midway along it, about a decade ago, a Seneca woman's burial from 1660 was found completely intact. At the bottom of the steep ravine, almost below it on Langmuir Crescent was the Bobby House, I spoke of. Nearby in the park at the bottom of Raymond Avenue steps and adjacent to Humbercrest Boulevard is the National Sites and Monument Board plaque commemorating the Toronto Carrying Place. It's a couple of hundred yards to the east of where Raymond's house was. Uh, 
in the middle of what was the lane to his home. Out at Jane Street, the fifth concession, are Homesmith's Bobby Point Gates, the entrance of Bobby Point Road. They are seen here in 1912, before one Bobby Point Road was built. Kathleen Lazar listed it as her residence in 1913 on the membership lift list of the Toronto branch of the Canadian Women's Historical Association. They were the babes that originally saved Fort York. Bobby Point is currently approved as a heritage conservation district area, a uh, district study area. These ephemeral layers of cultural impact have impressed themselves upon this strong architecture of landscape, becoming part of it, enabling them to cling, imbuing the earth, air, and water with storied spirits. This coherent collection of sites have been protected by Holmesmith's vision and sense of place, respect for Mother Earth, and space for the eye to stare into. The city must now continue with the community to preserve this culturally evolved landscape imprinted on a spectacularly preserved piece of Mother Earth. And I regret that the city is not holding very well on what they're doing on Riverside Drive. Thank you.